Hello, everyone. Good morning and welcome to the grand finale. Today is our very, very last masterclass. And I hope you, like me and like all of our collaborators today, feeling a little tad bittersweet. This in itself is our body and our mind forming a new mood. And over the next few minutes, what I present to you might be taken in through your mind in perhaps a more effective way than usual. So again, that's that little play on mood learning. And I have a few more things to say about it to bring everything together. Uh, yes, I, there are some comments in the chat group about a new look. I've, I have taken off my glasses today. And this morning, I had to have a, a bit of a tidy up in the hair department. Uh, because tomorrow, uh, I actually need to uh, film a few webinars for open day. Every year, once a year, we open our doors to the public and showcase the University of Queensland always in August. But because of coronavirus, this year, our open day will be a virtual open day. So feel free to join us as well. That is um, the 2nd of August. It is a Sunday and um, feel free to come and explore and tour the campus in a virtual space. It, it'll, it'll be quite fun. So that's what I'm doing tomorrow. Thank you uh, very much for joining us again. And let me share my screen with everyone. Uh, today we have um, a nice opportunity to put everything together. I'm going to start us off with a summary of all of these masterclasses and the key take home messages. I think what is important is also some of the ideas that have been relayed to you, um, because those ideas are of course for you to modify and adapt or even use immediately. Then we want to talk a little bit about how your journey as an educator needs to constantly evolve. You too need to evolve and adapt. And one of the best ways to do this is ensuring that we have a robust framework to evaluate our practice. So I'd like to share with you a framework that you might use. And I'm calling out to the senior educators, the, the, those in senior management, to consider the way in which staff get appraised. And maybe some of the ways in which we do that at the university might be more effective ways at appraising the performance of teachers and senior educators alike. I also want to very quickly now extend again a warm welcome to those not joining us through Zoom, through the webinar, but joining us on our YouTube live stream. Very, very shortly, you will see the link again to the YouTube live stream appear in your chat group. And please feel free again to share that link so that all of your colleagues can enjoy um, the session and benefit from some of the stuff that we share today. Today, like I mentioned, is also a great opportunity for us to uh, clarify any doubts and also to take care of your questions. I apologize that the last few days we didn't really have a chance to properly take care of everyone's questions. We've, we've dedicated a substantial amount of time today to do it, so hopefully we can get that done. Um, just a quick reminder, before I do that, more than 400 of you have already completed yesterday's quiz, which was the final quiz. There are only three quizzes to complete, and the average score from yesterday's quiz so far is 6.22 out of eight points, so that's quite good. I want to remind everyone, that you don't have to complete the quizzes immediately. The quizzes need to be completed by Sunday only if you want the certificate. If you don't want the certificate, then you can do it anytime. But if you do want the certificate, then please complete the quiz by Sunday. And then please give us a few more days next week to um, process all the information and before we issue the certificates likely towards the end of next week. So please be patient and thank you for your patience. I want to re-emphasize again, many of you saying that there are difficulty accessing the quiz 
and completing the quiz, there is a good chance that that is a result of the device itself. So we recommend refreshing or using a different device to try it out. So remember, please complete the quizzes by this Sunday so that we can process the data next week and process your completion certificates. So today is a quick summary. And then finally thinking about how we evaluate our practice. What have we learned? I've decided to categorize this summary in these four pillars that we see here. We started out on Monday defining the modern learner and the modern teacher. So some of the key takeaway messages from that, firstly, is that the modern learner is what we can describe as a needs-based learner. We see a lot of changes in the way that they learn, largely because they are completely overwhelmed and distracted with lots and lots of information, probably because of advances in digital technology. So the modern learner is a needs-based learner because of the overwhelming amount of information that has caused the way in which they process that information to evolve. In other words, they themselves have internal filters that rank what they deem as valuable and important, such that when they do learn, they learn based on what they need to learn. And we as teachers need to evolve along with those changes in learning styles. So we too are transitioning. Our role is less and less like a source of information, but rather a facilitator of learning. So less and less are we didactic styles of teaching where we just give information and set tasks for completion and assess those tasks but rather we are finding more and more creative ways to facilitate learning. And that can involve a number of things, including pre-learning, post-learning, and really maximizing the limited amount of time that we have in class for the consolidation of knowledge. The idea that we shared in that masterclass was in response to students' attention spans diminishing. We know that we cannot put a quantity on that average attention span because that's task dependent. The more interested you are in a task, the longer your attention span is likely to be. But one thing we can all agree on is that keeping our students engaged is a bit of a challenge nowadays. So one solution is repackaging what we teach into bite-sized pieces that allow the student to progress from one module to the next, empowering their learning, having some ownership of that learning, and feeling a sense of achievement that they are able to proficiently progress from one module to the next. So that's what we learned in the first masterclass. On Tuesday, we then explored the need for relevance in the classroom to work. Obviously, we explored that we don't have to do this by actually giving them placements or internships. That's what a technical college or a vocational institute or a university can do. But for a school, we can find again, creative ways to make what we do work relevant. Because work integrated learning, we must admit, really is another alternative for effective learning. When students can see themselves actually applying this in the future, they're going to be more willing to learn and chances of them becoming more proficient at it increase. We discuss a few key ideas that you can implement. Firstly, we talked about rewriting our lesson plans such that we maintain those verbs relative to them being cognitive, psychomotor or affective verbs. But we talked about changing the nouns that accompany those verbs into work relevant nouns so that we ourselves know why we are doing and teaching what we are teaching. Because down the track, it's relevant in this workplace or that industry or that profession or in research. We also considered a plethora of activities that are a bit creative and allow for a bit of fun in the assessment itself, but also work relevance. There was quite a lot of interest in video diaries, but we also considered infographics, 
uh, oral presentations, group interviews, individual interviews, um, and other creative ways in which we can bring work relevance into an assessment. We can be creative in that space. And then finally, we also discuss how when we design assessment criteria or marking rubrics that the student gets assessed upon, we can again introduce work relevant terms so that they see how they're being assessed, not necessarily for highly academic skills, but rather a, a holistic approach to their response whether that is, uh, or their performance, whether that is an oral presentation or a written assessment. If we design key performance indicators that are work relevant, the student probably will become more motivated to do a good job. Then of course, everybody got excited by the prospects of mood learning, which really offers us a very exciting area of, again, discovery and research in teaching and learning. This is a very, very new concept but it's an amalgamation of psychology, brain science and neuroscience. Um, and I guess our understanding of how emotions really have a big effect of the thought processes at play at the point in time a child learns. This might have implications on when we teach, but definitely how we teach. And there are other I guess, strategies that accompany mood learning that allow us to take advantage of resetting biological clocks, circadian rhythms in our bodies that might then also improve learning. So watch this space. And I promise you that I'll do my best to get the right academics on board that might be the subject matter experts, and maybe we can design another masterclass series for you and your colleagues. So let's look forward to more modern pedagogy and teaching strategies in the years to come. I'm very happy we're on this journey together. Finally, yesterday's masterclass opened our eyes to authentic assessment. And remember that authentic assessment is not necessarily work related because there is a time and place for workplace assessments, but that's very, very different to what is authentic assessment. Because in the grand scheme of things, and in most education systems today, there is still summative assessment in the shape and form of an external examination that every student takes uh, at the same time. You know, CBSE or IB or A-levels, you know, there are exam periods at dedicated times. So authentic assessment still in some shape and form needs to relate back to exam style questions but authentic assessment is different in that we actually assess for skills that are more worthwhile, significant, and meaningful. Meaningful skills, meaningful knowledge, meaningful to learning. And the ideas that we shared was ways in which we can start developing those skills, particularly in an inquiry-based way, when we bring the outside of the classroom into the classroom. Many of us by the, by the fortune of digital technology are already doing it where you can use powerful imagery from the web and integrate that into your slides for your classroom. But we can be even more creative and be even more thoughtful with how we contextualize subject matter. Let the student come to the conclusion themselves. That usually makes for really effective learning. And finally, we had a little activity where you reshaped your past exam questions. And I want to thank all of you that responded. There were a good 200 or so of you. And I picked a selection of them to present yesterday, but also I have taken majority of them and put them into a Word document that is already in the online resource, uh, in the folder. And that Word document has, uh, I sort of categorized it into political science, science, mathematics, um, uh, arts and humanities. Um, I think I put geography and history inside humanities, uh, then English, English literature and general knowledge, uh, technologies, because I understand that there are many of you that teach ICT. Um, and I think I also had a, a category on 
uh, digital tech, no, on business and economics and accounting. So I sort of divided the questions so you can hone in directly on what some of your other teachers in your community community came up with. And you'll see that it's as simple as just swapping the cognitive verbs to assess for more application of knowledge. And one benefit of that, given that most of our students will go to university, is that that's really going to transition them to university teaching and learning a lot smoother. Um, so thank you all for the incredible work that you all did. So we had three days of master classes that we did lots and lots of different things in different shapes and forms. And I do hope that there is a small part of that that you could have take home that was useful for your own practice. Many people often ask me, what's a top tip that I have for teachers? And I'll share with you my top tip to you. My top tip is based on an evaluation and my interaction with students. And whenever I meet students, because I, I'm not a high school teacher, I teach at the university, but whenever I get an opportunity to interact with high school students, I always ask them about the teachers that made the most impact and how they remember those teachers. The response is always the same. I remember this teacher, not because of what was thought, what was taught to them, but how it was taught to them. The most memorable teachers are the humorous teachers, are the effective teachers, are the teachers that really bring a new dimension to learning. Students always tell me that the most memorable teachers are those teachers where the connection existed, not those teachers that are traditional in their approach, boring in the classroom, but rather the teachers that are creative, innovative, humorous, and authentic. And so my top tip to teachers is to invest in yourself. The more you invest in yourself, the more you develop your own personality for the classroom. Your students remember you for your personality, not what you teach, because there's always going to be someone out there that can teach them the same thing. In this day and age, you will find lots of online resources that teach exactly what you teach in the classroom. But what makes you stand out as a teacher is how you teach that same material. So invest in yourself because that's the best thing you can do for your students. And together, let's start by empowering ourselves because it's us empowering ourselves that will later empower our students who then in turn empower the future. And I hope you've really, really enjoyed the UQ Educator Empowerment Masterclass Series. And so now I'd like to introduce a framework, and this will take me maybe five, 10 minutes to explain, a framework by which you can evaluate your practice. I think it's very important to take a step back maybe at least once a year, the academics at UQ at least, we do a proper appraisal, a formal appraisal at least once a year. This is for, for us as academics relevant for applying for promotion, academic promotion. And there are many, many aspects of our career that we get appraised upon. And one of those aspects is the scholarship of teaching and learning. I find that there are lots and lots of relevance in the scholarship of teaching and learning, even for primary school, high school teachers. So I'd like to offer you a framework by which you can consider how you have added value to yourself, your practice, but also to your community. And maybe senior educators or senior management can consider integrating some parts of this framework into the way you yourself appraise your staff. This is the framework that we use. And again, th this slides, these slides are available so you can take bits and pieces from it. You would put together a portfolio of academic achievement. For a teacher, academic achievement takes the shape and form of the scholarship of teaching and learning. It's not just about how you yourself learn about modern teaching and learning but how you then go on to help others 
in your school, in your community to become better teachers. Or it can also involve ways in which you evaluate your innovations in teaching in a quantifiable way, in a qualitative way sometimes. Um, and so you can actually prove evidence-based that what you've done is in fact better. So this would maybe be a Word document. And this tiny little column at the end is deliberately small because that would be where you fill in the details of how you address these three criteria. So a framework like this is not meant to be onerous. It's not meant for you to feel like it's such a chore to put it together, but rather it's different ways in which you can measure your own performance. And it is a very, it's a self, you know, you use your integrity and it's a sort of a self-directed approach. So you fill this in relative to what you consider as meaningful to put in. So what we typically would suggest for teachers is when you are considering your role in your community, consider what might be a theme. So here I know it's plural and it's multiple themes. For academics like myself, we certainly need to have multiple themes. But for you, maybe just one theme. Could you be the, could your theme be you are the linkage between industry and your school? Could your theme between be um, the linkage of modern pedagogy with practice in your school? Your theme could very well be the, um, uh, uh, I guess, mentorship of new teachers. So consider a very, very specific theme and get really, really good at it. But then consider what are the quality and impact measures relative to your theme. So there are some examples here. And I guess I mentioned these because I understand certainly in Australia, it's becoming increasingly uh, um, popular and also the amount of money given is starting to increase. And I mean this for grants that schools can apply for. So we have World Science Festival, we have National Science Week, for example, but there are many, many grants that schools can apply for. And these funding bodies actually give these schools little pockets of money to actually do stuff at their school or for their communities. So this is an opportunity for you to record some of the, I guess, additional um, uh, sort of initiatives that you've undertaken. But it's not just limited to that. You know, as teachers, I'm sure some of you are involved in policy making. Some of you are involved in, you know, developing and, and, and disseminating new stuff. So these are things that I feel you really should be recorded, that should be recording. And when you have an opportunity to get appraised by your seniors or by your principals, that you can show them a record of your contributions to your community. And then of course, collaborations, and that can of course be as simple as collaborating with a local business, a local university or other schools. So hopefully this is an opportunity for you to start if you don't already have a formal framework, that this is a framework that's not onerous, but a framework that can assist you with evaluating your practice, okay? All of us at university have this in some shape and form. And I think for us, it's really important because it, 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 it brings a lot of meaning to what we do. You know, in the same way that I have done this masterclass with you, I would be including that in my own appraisal under this section. So maybe you yourselves can empower yourselves and empower even more teachers. This is the scholarship of teaching and learning. And I'm very happy that you're part of this community. So I have a few more resources before we come back to you. Um, so yesterday, I think there was some uh, oh, wait, this is not about yesterday. So this one is about evidence-based teaching. Um, this is, I guess, an extension uh, for you all. And I know that there are many senior educators uh, joining us that might be at a stage in your career where you want to do a little bit more. And I know I have received some emails for, from some of you that are considering transitioning uh, either from a school to to a different type of system. 
I know that it's very, very popular. Uh, and International Baccalaureate, the IB program is starting to pick up in India. In fact, sometime in March, uh, a group of um, senior educators from Jaipur actually came to Australia to visit us because we have a lot of IB program, of IB schools here because they themselves are thinking of implementing the IB program. And I do quite a bit of work with the IB teachers here and I was giving them a rundown of how the IB schools in Australia are deeply embedded with us at the university. Um, so if you're in that position, or if you're in a different position where you'd like to go back into research at a university, maybe you're considering doing your master's or your master's of philosophy, which is a short version of a research intensive program, or you're thinking of doing your doctorate of philosophy, um, then one of the things you need to start thinking about is how you can really quantify and qualify your work through a rigorous research process. And so I highly encourage you all to consider thinking about ways that you can publish your work in journals if you haven't already done this. I know it's asking a lot, but I am seeing an increasing amount of high school teachers that collaborate with local university researchers and together co-publish in these journals. They go a long way, not just in shaping your own professional development, but in the professional practice of others in the community beyond India, beyond your country, because many of these journals are international journals. But in the same way that you can publish your work, you can also use these journals as a resource and pick up modern stuff. So I found a collection of journals that I feel are appropriate for your community. Um, the Australian Journal of Education is everywhere from primary to um, uh, pre-university. The American Journal of Education is the same. The Journal of Mathematics Teacher Education is an American-based one, but is largely has a bigger primary school component. The High School Journal, as the name suggests, is a high school journal. And the Australian Educational Researcher are uh, for those looking at the transition from high school to university. So there are many, many journals that uh, you might have to subscribe to, but some of them you can access articles freely, or you can probably get enough that you need from the abstracts um, just to keep up with what's going out there. And so I leave these um, opportunities with you. Before we go into a Q&A session, I just have a few additional announcements to make. I want to remind everyone that the certificates are only given to the individuals who were in the original list of registrants. So you are participating. So unfortunately, if you were not part of the first batch and you're joining us in YouTube, uh, we are not going to be giving you the certificate, but you're more than welcome to assess your knowledge through the quizzes. Those of you that are after the completion certificate, remember that what you will need to do is complete all three quizzes from Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. The links were already provided to you within the slides, but we will provide all the links again at the very end in the chat group. So at the very end, we're going to request that everybody not type in anything into the chat group for a minute or two so that we can give you all of the important links. You can copy and paste it somewhere in your computer, and we request that you don't fill in the chat group by typing in it at the end of today. There are a few other announcements. I'd like to invite everyone for another opportunity to connect with some of um, our team at the university. Um, Education Connect in conjunction with us and also in association with CNBC TV 18, news18.com. And we're also happy that School News is supportive of this event. Um, we'll be running um, a short seminar today uh, at 2 p.m. So after this, you might consider uh, joining us for that one. So there is a registration link and it's an opportunity to, to I guess, figure out what are some of the future plans and some of the pillars that sort of um, shape the future of education. So uh, Mr. Gitesh, who is also going to grace us with his presence um, shortly today, 
will be joined by some of our UQ team, including Dr. Jessica Gallagher. Dr. Jessica Gallagher is our Pro Vice Chancellor for Global Engagement and Entrepreneurship. And she actually is not just um, an academic or in our chancellery, but she's also teach, teach, teaches into German literature. So how cool is that? So you'll find many academics like myself um, doing lots of different things. We don't like to pigeonhole ourselves. We like to do everything. Um, you'll also meet our Director of Future Students, Ms. Alison Jenkins. You'll also meet Associate Professor Keith Chappell. Remember on Monday when I told you UQ is actually the only Australian organization tasked with, the corona, with one of the coronavirus vaccines to fast track the development of the vaccine, um, Associate Professor Chappell is actually the man behind that vaccine. He's the, the chief investigator. And of course, our principal advisor for strategic initiatives, Mr. Sagar Bahadur, will also be part of this panel. So do join us today if you have um, some time. And so finally, I'd like to formally thank all our collaborators for this series of masterclasses. I also hope that you enjoyed them. I'd like to thank Trade and Investment Queensland. I'd like to thank Study Queensland, but most importantly, a big thank you and the deepest and most sincere gratitude to Mr. Ravi Setlani and his team from School News, with, without which this week would not have been possible at all. So thank you, Mr. Ravi, and also thank you to all of you for being a part of today. Remember that you can keep in touch with me. That's my email there, and I will leave it. And please also keep in touch with School News because they've got lots and lots and lots of resources and opportunities for you. Thank you very, very much, India. It's been a wonderful four days. I hope you've took something useful from the series. And now is a great opportunity to get some of your questions answered. Thank you very much. Hi, Dr. G. Uh, we have uh, Gitesh here. So uh, he is, uh, so, so, so are we gonna give uh, another five minutes for Gitesh to, uh, you know, uh, thank all the attendees. And from there, I mean, you can pick up a few questions. So guys, I mean, do not go anywhere. And please keep putting your questions in Q&A. And after Gitesh is done, uh, Dr. G will again pick up a few questions, sir. Over to you, Gitesh. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, thank you, Dr. G. Good morning. Hello, everyone. It's uh, good to talk to you on the last day of the Educator Empowerment Program. Uh, as you know, this is uh, Study Queensland's first pilot project with the University of Queensland and School News to empower and upskill teachers on modern teaching and learning experiences. I believe the response has been phenomenal and so has been the attendance. Dr. G has won the hearts and minds of everyone here. Uh, you know, he's got an innate ability to share his learning in a simple manner, backed by some strong evidence. The concept of a modern learner as a need-based learning, I believe has been a wonderful way of explaining how we can teach students in their limited attention span. Also the way, uh, the importance of relevance from various angles and how it impacts the teaching. Uh, the most interesting, I believe, has been the mode learning to see how emotions play a part in the learning process. And finally, the authentic assessment and evaluation. I understand from my colleagues that this masterclass has brought out the understanding of all the modern pedagogies, and we are proud uh, to be able to deliver that to you. Thank you all for the overwhelming support and joining us for all the four days. From uh, Queensland universities and education institutions, we have workshops for teachers and students for promoting innovation, entrepreneurship, and leadership. Since this has been very successful, we will certainly be coming back to you with similar workshops that will help you in the career. As I said in the first day, teaching is a profession that, can, that, uh, that creates all other professions. So also at this point, I would like to urge you to look at the various resource materials developed by Queensland government in association with schools and universities on all subjects at our website, which will supplement your efforts in online teaching. Queensland universities have a treasure of resources, both in terms of experts and resource materials, which we'll try to bring to you later on. Do share your expectations. My heartfelt thank to University of Queensland, Dr. G, Sagar and team, Ravi and team for diligently and passionately making this workshop in such a short span of time. My colleagues would be reaching out to you to remain connected and we do look forward to working with all of you. 
Have a wonderful year ahead. Happy teaching. Happy creating the future citizens of tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gitesh. And I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, if the times are good, I mean, next year, I mean, we could kind of, you know, uh, also visit Queensland and uh, on a study tour, I mean, with a few uh, Indian educators. And uh, before you pick up a few questions, Dr. Ang, I mean, I uh, wanted to say a few words to you. Uh, it seems everyone wants me to express appreciation for your inspiring masterclasses. Your years of research, your depth of understanding, and your ability to present the subject in such an interesting way produce one of the most memorable mornings in our community history. I personally appreciated your talk on mood learning. The subject intrigued all of us, and uh, we plan to learn more. Please consider adding our community to your other lectures. I hope that you will want to be involved in our flagship conference next year in India, and I'll request uh, Kitesh uh, and Rembya, I mean, to uh, arrange, I mean, that you uh, travel to India as and when the times are good and uh, do a live masterclass with uh, a larger audience there. Uh, we will, of course, uh, send you a call for presenters invite uh, for a live masterclass there, and it will be great to learn from you live. I, on behalf of all the attendees of this masterclass, thank you for your valuable contribution, and I look forward to visit you at the University of Queensland sooner than later. And I like black coffee, I mean, just for your reference. Thank you, Dr. G. Over that, is very, that is very, very good to know. And um, uh, Australian coffee has been consistently ranked as the world's best. So I cannot wait to share that with you all. Great. Over to you, Dr. G, for picking up a few questions. And Aga, you want to uh, copy her? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Anaga, hello. Yes, so Anaga is going to moderate some questions and let's hope to get through as, as many of your questions as possible. Uh, thank you all once again. Those were very he heartfelt words and I, I, and I hope this is not the last time we see each other. Um, Anaga. Sure, once again, thank you SKU News, thank you uh, TIQ, Ravi and Gitesh and Ramya. Um, so I am the face behind the voice that you all have been hearing <laughs> over the past three days. So I'm just going to go through a couple of questions that we have received here. Um, okay, the first one, Dr. G. Internship and sandwich, which is the best for, for which age group? Could you elaborate? Yeah, great. That's a, a, a great question. Uh, without, without, I guess, um, I, I think one, one thing that's really obvious with internships. So actually, let's make the distinction first. So um, I, I think we did answer this question, but very quickly, an internship is, of course, in a workplace setting. So where a student spends an extended amount of time actually in a workplace, a sandwich course is not necessarily at a workplace, but it's often an extended of period of time outside of study semesters. So one of the concepts that we did discuss in today's learning environment is the discontinuous nature of it. You do one thing in one year and then done, dusted, you don't revisit it again. So it, these sandwich courses are really the bridge between semesters. Hopefully more and more of them become available freely internationally. Um, and so a sandwich course I feel is something that, that the objective really is um, uh, work skills. And so it's not necessarily a work experience, but it could be work skills. So those are courses that could be uh, what are some skills in research? Uh, writing skills, um, uh, you know, how do you put together a, a, a CV, a resume, um, those sorts of skills. And you could undertake a sandwich course in order to keep up with those sorts of things. Um, and, and, and so in terms of age group, here in Australia, it's not uncommon for our year 11s to start taking up part-time work to support their families or to get work experience. So that is 16 years of age. We are fortunate to also come from a country where um, there is a minimum wage. And so the students do need to get paid at a certain level, uh, which sort of gives them a very authentic uh, uh, um, experience into what their working lives will be like in the future. So in the context of when an internship might be appropriate for say your uh, India, uh, I would definitely say not until their senior years. Um, anything in middle school, up to senior school, sandwich courses would also be appropriate. Thank you for that, Dr. G. And could you elaborate on how mood learning is different from social emotional learning? 
Yes, yeah, so of course, there's a lot of um, the, the, the literature out there that's available on social and um, uh, uh, I guess emotional learning. Largely, those studies, if you really, really scrutinize them, don't necessarily offer you strategies or solutions to take advantage of the social situation or the emotions experience. Most of the time, they are simply correlations between something that you can measure, whether that is brain chemistry, brain waves, or nonverbal cues on their face, correlated with um, you know, a learning outcome or an activity that they've done or performance assessment in some shape and form. Mood learning wants to take that one step further and that's synergizing all of this to give teachers a toolkit that allows you to actually implement strategies backed by evidence um, so that in class, you yourself can um, sort of create an environment that elicits a particular mood for effective learning. In other words, that's everything from what you say, how you say, your nonverbal cues, your choice in visual aids. It's basically coming up with a formula, if you like, as to what's the best way to do it to elicit the best response we want for effective learning. So that is the distinction. Thanks for that, Dr. G. The next one is, could you throw a little bit more light on evidence-based learning? So evidence-based learning is very straightforward. Evidence-based learning is not doing anything based on your gut. I think a lot of teachers do that because such is the nature of our profession. We're in the classroom, we're at the cold phase, we've got so many hours with our students um, and so little time to innovate and get creative. So oftentimes we just do things based on our gut. Um, you know, one day in class, you might have done something and then the student laughed. So you started doing more of it. So that's, that's what we do. But what we should do is use evidence-based learning. So what that means is actually looking at studies that have shown and actually measure the effect of these um, new strategies, new pedagogy, um, and you find them in lots and lots of those journals available online. Now, obviously not everybody can afford a subscription and nor do you have the time to go through every single paper. I think in this day and age, you're going to find that there, well, for a few, for, for one, you know, you know, you've learned a lot in the past four days because of my synthesis of a lot of those studies for you. So look, look for these sorts of you know, professional development opportunities. Um, there are also a group of emerging, um, this, this is an emerging career, and these are science communicators. So oftentimes these are individuals that um, understand uh, the research aspect, but maybe also have done a dual degree in arts or journalism. And so they understand the science and they understand the research or they understand the psychology and the neuroscience, but they also equally know how to communicate that to broaden the audience beyond just other scientists. So you will find lots and lots of articles that are becoming more popular written by these science communicators that can synthesize everything together for you. That's evidence-based learning. And in other words, not using it, not, not, not teaching based on your gut, but rather teaching based on proven strategies and methodologies, uh, which we find in the literature. That's evidence-based learning. And speaking of resources that are available, Dr. G, would you be able to share a few links about metacognition and mood learning on uh, the bit.ly link that we shared at the start? Because I have Great. a couple of questions for that. So if you can just yeah, share sure. the links, I think that would help. Great. Okay. So um, so all those slides have the links. I'll just make, I, I, think, I think I can make um, a few things obvious. One, method, on metacognition, um, that book, so both actually happen to be books. So on metacognition, you will know that I shared a book on, on one of the slides. I highly recommend that that book is actually quite an expensive book, 
but you can access about 10% of the book at no cost. So I would highly recommend that um, you look, look, look up maybe specific sections of the book that interest you on metacognition because not everything's going to be relevant. My favorite section is the section on writing. Um, and so that's one, so that's in the slide. For mood learning, that book by Bronwyn Cripp, Design Your Mind, is, is not expensive at all. I highly recommend that you purchase a copy um, because it, it, it's going to help you beyond the classroom. Uh, it might make you um, a better spouse or a better parent yourself because that whole thing is all about that, starts off with that triangle because that's not mine. That triangle is uh, uh, from that book, Design Your Mind. And then you start to explore different ways in which you can, you know, prime one end of each of that pyramid. So that book is actually a toolkit, but it's not specific to education. But we are probably going to start finding um, really creative ways that we can draw from those tools. So for in terms of a resource, Design Your Mind by Bronwyn Cribb is a good idea to get. It's not very expensive and I do believe you can purchase an ebook. So if you're after resources for mood learning, I would highly recommend Design Your Mind. So if you um, look up the slides that I, I created for Masterclass 2, um, you will see what the cover of the book looks like. And if you just Google um, Design Your Mind, Crib, C-R-I-B-B, that's the author, uh, you'd be able to to maybe get that and then and then learn more about about designing um, your mind. Yeah. Thanks for that, Dr. G. And could you throw some light on? Um, you previously said it's important to invest in yourself. So I have a question here that says, how can a teacher invest in himself or the students? Could you give a few more tips? So what I mean by invest, I know the accounting teachers are looking at me, oh, invest means money. I have to pay money to improve myself. Well, in some cases, yes, right? Um, I guess what I mean by invest is oftentimes as teachers, you know, we start off our career incredibly passionate and incredibly motivated and we get drained. You know, I, I think you'll all agree with me when I say that the turnover rate in teachers is incredibly high. We get many, we get a lot of interest, but, but we see a lot of, you know, equally, we see a lot of teachers leave the profession. That's what we see here in Australia. We see a lot of teachers that after their, um, um, I guess, um, uh, contractual time with, with, with us as teachers leave. Um, and, and you wonder why, you know, it's such a meaningful profession. I know it doesn't pay well, you know, but it doesn't pay poorly either, you know, but yet, yet we get this brain drain in some of our best teachers. Why, why does that happen? And I feel like it's, it's, it's a lack of support that we give our teachers in order to make them better versions of themselves. You know, a lot of the admin, you know, classroom behavior management is completely demoralizing. So when I say invest in yourself, what I mean by that is, you know, you guys already are practitioners of investing in yourself. Otherwise, you wouldn't have attended this masterclass series. So it's individuals like yourselves that are willing to do more, go above and beyond, attend these sorts of offerings, um, you know, or even, you know, be willing to go through the literature, uh, find out modern ways, find out qualitative evidence-based ways of, of improving yourself. Um, that is the best way you can invest in yourself. So that's my, that's my tip, okay? That's my invest in yourself. And I guess on, on another side, you know, I, I like personally for me as an educator, um, I, I guess we're very lucky in Australia and we're, we're lucky in a university setting where throughout our journey, we, we see our students for, for the good three or four years of their time at university of their degree. We get to know them very, very well. Um, and, um, and oftentimes we build a relationship with a subset of them beyond the classroom. So we're very, very fortunate to, be, to become more than just 
educator for some of our students. We, we become mentor, we become friend. And that's where the investment in your personality becomes even more crucial because what you want to do is set, set yourself up as, as a good role model to, the, to these students. Um, so I think investing yourself on top of being on top of, you know, uh, the best practice in teaching is a little bit also about, you know, thinking about what, what, what sort of person, what sort of example are we setting? What kind of a role model are we for our students? So maybe we need to, to we can also invest in ourselves in that way. Thanks, Dr. G. I'm trying to gonna, I'm gonna try to um, merge three questions. So earlier mm -hmm. you said that students can start deviating after a while, um, especially if it's something that they're not very interested in. Um, their attention span is kind of short-lived. How would you, uh, how would you try to bring them back into the mood and uplift their spirits to make them want to learn more? And what would you do if they started deviating? Yeah, I, I, I think that that's great. Um, that, that certainly is a good question. I think here's where, here's where that, I guess, innovation in authentic assessment really, really has, and uh, you know, a, a, it will give you a helping hand here. Oftentimes you will find with those authentic assessment or, or new ways in which we assess our students, um, whether it's a video diary, whether it's an infographic, whether it's a group interview, Oftentimes, these are assessment pieces that span over a period of time where we introduce the assessment very, very strategically um, and maybe even have skill building workshops to be before the, the actual performance. Um, so one thing I feel that's really, really useful is going to be mapping out assessment pieces that that give that level of continuity across your term or across your semester. That I think makes spacing out your teaching of the subject matter a little bit easier. The other thing that I've seen done really, really well, which um, some of the schools here do, because here in uh, Queensland at least, the school terms, there are four terms a year, which is maybe not dissimilar to India, and each term is about 10 weeks long. The private schools can do nine weeks. So private schools, nine weeks every term, public schools 10 weeks long uh, terms. Um, there's this um, idea of an action learning project. So there are, there are schools that I've interacted with that implement these action learning projects that will start the term of, so every term is going to be slightly different, but of course aligned to their curriculum. Uh, but they start off the term with a global challenge. So they give the students a global challenge and then as they teach the subject matter, it's all going to be relevant to that one global challenge, leading up to an action learning project where they then apply what they learn in a, a, a presentation at the end or an infographic at the end or, or, or some form of assessment at the end. In other words, what happens is students feel like, okay, I have an assessment at the end of this term I need to pay attention in class because I'm going to be able to find the clues and the knowledge that I need in order to exceed, uh, to excel in that, 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 that final piece of assessment. So here we call that an action learning project. Um, yes, an action learning project. So it starts off with a grand challenge and then scaffold that throughout the term. Every term they do something slightly different. So okay. maybe that those are some ideas for you. Lovely. And um, okay, so this, we have a question here that says, which type of closed ended question, or like an MCQ, a true or false or a short answer, would you think is most effective to test students knowledge? Yeah, so closed answer questions. Look, that there, there is, there is, you know, years and years of pedagogy and structure around closed response questions. I feel I feel like the close response, you, you are seeing that, that you are seeing that in terms of university style assessment, virtually you, will, you won't ever find closed style questions anymore. You, you, you get some of them in the first year courses, but then second, third year, no way, no way will you find true or false multiple choice questions. Now, Obviously, it's an easy way because marking is very, very easy with multiple choice or true or, or true or false. I do think there is, um, I do think 
there is some merit to them, even though they're becoming less popular at university. I, I think there's some merit to them because they they certainly assess a, a different skill set altogether because they are assessing, you know, critical reading skill sets, because oftentimes in a multiple choice question, there could be two or three correct answers, but one is the best answer of the lot. Um, and so, so I, I, th I think there is some merit to them because they, they do assess other skills. So in, if I had an opinion as to what exactly I feel is the best, I think the best is balance because you can argue that true or false has PQ has merit, single choice has merit, uh, fill in the blanks has merit. Um, I think it's striking a good, a good balance. And, and in, an, in an exam setting, I also feel like students enjoy that variety. I know in some cases that's not always possible. Um, just before we continue with questions, you will see that there is a little uh, poll before you now. Um, if you can quickly provide us your responses to them. And I do also believe that there is a more formal um, feedback that I welcome you to complete. It will really go a long way in helping us shape um, future offerings and maybe getting you know, other academics involved as well. Thanks, Dr. G. Um, okay, so I have two more questions, similar type. What kind of activities do you think can be performed for slow learners or differently abled students? Yeah, so I, I'm, I am not a child psychologist. I'm not a special ed educator. Um, that might be a question more appropriate for someone who is a specialist in special needs. Um, I will say, however, I, I just want to make one observation, and I really, really do hope that this is, this is the way that the education climate around the world is, is also evolving. Here in Australia, we are very encouraged by the increase in the number of special ed teachers. Um, we find that there are even more um, uh, uh, teachers that choose to specialize in special needs because that is an acknowledgement that the differently abled people um, really, really deserve some special attention. And so what we are seeing here in Australia is less and less special needs schools, although they still exist, but more and more special needs teachers in mainstream schools. And I'm hoping across the world that we see an increase in this where schools are also equipped with a brand new generation of teachers that are not just subject matter specialists, but also pedagogical specialists that take care very specifically of those students. So unfortunately, I can't offer you any suggestions because I am not a specialist in that area. Um, but I guess that was just one observation I thought I'd like to point out. And thank you for that, Dr. G. Um, do you think teachers should allow rote learning? Ah, good question. I, I get this debate a lot and I have come to the conclusion because I see this personally in myself as a learner when I underwent university. I am a rote learner, to be honest. I, I actually feel like I get a lot more out of the learning um, because that's a style that suits me. I think rather than being encouraging or discouraging of different styles of learning, I think it's exploring with your students the different styles of learning so that they can find something that works for them. Road learning is not necessarily just memorization because you can get creative with the way that you road learn. The way I road learn in, 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 at university was uh, we were, I guess, lucky to come from a university where uh, past year exam questions are given. So that's the same for IB, A-levels, and probably CBSE. You, you have a repository of past year exam questions. And my style was always to visit questions first, such that when I listen to the lectures and receive information, I knew, aha, what that lecturer just covered answered question five in the 2018 paper. But that's just my style, which might be a bit extreme. Um, so so I, think, I think rather than being encouraging or discouraging of methods of learning that we typically would find extreme, 
I would suggest that we explore that with a student um, to find the best style for them. Because um, you know, some people do benefit from that, that road learners, especially if they have a photographic memory, it, it's to their advantage. Thanks, Dr. G. And um, what do you think would be the most appropriate time span for which a lesson, lesson should be designed for most effective results? Great question. I love this. I think there's been a lot of thought and there's a lot of experimentation happening right now here in Australia. Different schools are trialing different things. Um, I, think, I think there is a lot to be said about reconfiguring um, the, the timetable. So I want to talk about the macro before I talk about the micro. I think there's something to be said about reconfiguring timetabling such that when we, when we teach, we might consider rather than having say physical education or the creative or liberal arts type courses that really utilize a different part of the brain, rather than having them interspersed with other things, you transition to a model where there is a dedicated day each week for those type of uh, co-curricular learning. So there are some schools here that instead of having say PE class, um, you know, one day a week that week, they would just have a single day for sport and all the other sort of co-curricular stuff such that if it's a science day, it's a science day. If it's a math day, it's a math day, so on and so forth. That's, that's one, one suggestion. We'll know more about that in the future. The other, the other consideration is the micro level. So exactly what duration? Uh, I think in general, you will find that most classes are 50 to 70 minutes in duration. And I think that seems to work very, very well. But I think we will also agree that uh, sometimes that's not enough. Um, as we start to explore creative and innovative ways to engage our students in the classroom, we, we, we realize that we actually need more time with them because we're giving them more opportunity to learn. So I feel like we do go back to a model where timetabling is such that you'd have English for three to four periods a week and you'd have two 50 minute periods and one bigger chunk. Certainly for science, we have to have that because of practical classes. Um, so I think existing models are okay. Um, we, I guess, just need to figure out how best to maximize the time. All right, Dr. G, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pose one more question to you and then I'm gonna let you read the question and answer session to see if there's anything that you'd want to answer. Sounds good. But this one is going to be um, design education and work integrated learning. Are they the same or are they different? are different because work integrated learning is really picking up work skills and that can be beyond design skills. Um, so design education uh, does maybe a lot more work in framework, structural understanding, networks, um, that there may be some overlap, but then definitely not the same thing. All right, Dr. G, I'm gonna let you just yes. read the question and answer. I'm gonna just open up now. Uh, while we're doing that, I just wanted to let everyone know that, you know, we are going to try to keep Dr. G with us as much as we can and have more of these sessions. So if you all would want to know um, what the University of Queensland is going to do next, please follow us on Instagram. Uh, you can follow Dr. G, you can follow myself, you can follow Shruti, you can also follow uh, School News and, and Ramya as well. You'll always be no noted of what's going to happen next. I will share my link on the chat box now. Thanks, Dr. G. Okay. Um, some questions here uh, about whether there, whether there are online university courses. Um, first, consider the edX platform. The edX platform has a lot of uh, free mini MOOCs that you can enroll in, and there might be something there suitable for you. Uh, at the University of Queensland, we are looking to roll out a series of what we call shorter form credentials. Those are not free, um, but they're not very expensive and they are completely online. And so maybe look forward to some of those. There's a question here that I'd like to take about um, 
uh, shining more light on the appraisal criteria. So remember that the, the, the framework that I suggested to you is, is not meant to be onerous, but rather to help you categorize some of your contributions to the teaching and learning uh, in your community, in your school or in your community. Um, I think we as teachers sometimes do a lot of things and then don't realize that we really should be recording what we're doing because it helps us actually become better at our practice. So um, uh, that framework is, is, is really a, a self-exploration. Uh, and my suggestion was purely for uh, if, if you are looking at putting behind uh, putting a framework behind how you appraise your staff, or if you have an existing framework, looking at how you can make it more relevant, uh, consider some of those categories and the key performance indicators within those categories. Um, okay, uh, I won't take any questions on curriculum design because that's not where I work in. Um, uh, Oh, I, I, I'm not also going to ask uh, answer the questions about um, language. Again, not my area of expertise. Um, ah, I, I think this is a great uh, a question, which is, you know, in this day and age of, of virtual teaching, like how we're doing this right now, um, how do we make assessment authentic? It's tricky, isn't it? And I don't know if there's sufficient research just yet, um, but, but the, the premise and the purpose of authentic learning, remember, is that it doesn't, there's no link between the assessment and the delivery of the subject matter. So the whole purpose of authentic assessment is such that a student can't cheat because it's an authentic response to the task at hand. So, you know, something like a video diary, something like an, uh, uh, an infographic or an interview session, you, you can prepare for it, but you can't cheat. So, so I think, I think um, that's the whole premise behind authentic assessment and considering implementing that because, because there, there are just fewer ways that you can, you can, you can cheat. And there are the, the chances when you assess them that the results are actually authentic. Uh, this semester has been interesting. We have done a lot of assessment online, um, everything. Everything you can think of under the sun, there's been an assessment in some shape and form at UQ. Bearing in mind, we have, um, we have 50,000 students at UQ and about 2000 academics. So, so many, many different assessment modes. Um, I think in general, the consensus has been that when we look at the distribution of marks relative to previous years, there is a general shift up because now the students can actually take advantage of the fact that they have more time to actually do these uh, questions and these assessments, but there is still that distribution. So what that tells us is that we're still addressing uh, and we're still rewarding uh, uh, a, a normal distribution of competencies. Although in general, by virtue of students having more time, there might be a upscale in, 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 in the marks. So I guess what that tells us is, you know, assessment can still be authentic because you are still getting that distribution because if it weren't for that, you'd expect everybody to do extremely well or everybody to do extremely, extremely poorly. Okay. Um, oh, I like this question. Can a teacher be a friend? I think the question should be, should, should a teacher be a friend? I do think that at the high school level, there needs to still be that boundary, but you know, at the university, that's a different story. Um, I, I do think at the high school level, there still needs to be a boundary. Um, I don't think teachers should be friends. There still needs to be some structure, but I do think that there's something to be said about the teachers who are friendly, because oftentimes it's that rapport that is built that uh, maybe, maybe goes a long way in the receptivity of the child. You know, you, you certainly don't want to, to have a, a child fear you, but you still don't, you, you, you still need to have structure. Okay. Um,
Um, there are some questions here about career guidance, which I don't think I'm best placed for. Hopefully, most schools now have career guidance departments that um, are able to, to take care of the career needs of their students or, 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 or thinking about future education. Um, okay, we've covered some of that. We've covered some of that. Um, I might, in the interest of time, maybe take two more questions. Ah. I like this one. How can we work on writing skills during online classes in the pandemic time? So one of those suggestions, which I highly recommend is actually not giving your students um, the notes in completion. I would be keep, I would be giving them, I would be giving them blanks in the notes that you give them and then they fill in the blanks as you teach. So they're finding for the clues in your slides or in what you say. I think that usually is quite effective. I literally, just before I, I came online for this masterclass, had a two hour session with one of our colleges on the Gold Coast. And because it's far away, I do it virtually. So that might be a good example. One thing I do a lot with the high schools here is a lot of the high schools engage to actually conduct writing, scientific writing skill workshops with their students. This is specifically directed at the um, specifically directed at the uh, uh, um, how do I say at a particular assessment uh, I'll just share with you because I want to show it actually looks like so just give me a second I'll give you some idea so imagine this is a written assessment let's say a 2000 word assignment okay give me a second um, I do a few things with them I might just share my screen and give me a sec i need that and i also need that okay so bearing in mind that a 2000 word assignment is an overwhelming so we need to ease them in so i need to share screen with you which one do i click oh um let me get out of this let me get out of this. Okay, I'm just going to show you the slides that I would typically use. I just wanted to introduce you to the assessment piece. So most of our assessment pieces in Australia will be accompanied with what we call an instrument specific marking guide, which legally we have to share with our students. So it shows them the benchmarks that they're being marked upon. It gives them very, very specific criteria to which they are marked upon. For example, in a 2000 word research investigation, those of you that teach the IB syllabus, this is an adaptation of one of the big assessment pieces. So research and planning, another criteria, analysis and interpretation, another criteria, conclusion and evaluation. So when I do my online workshop with them, we have a working document. And we have a working document where initially at the start, at the start of this document, this is all gone. This is a blank like this. So I give them a tip where I say, look, what have I done? I have scaffolded and given you a skeleton for your actual submission. You will see that we include the top tier ISMGs, the, in, the Instrument Specific Marking Guide. These are the specific criteria that you must address. And then we do the writing with them. Oh, where did that go? Uh, this one, which we, we did just now in class, we were talking about DNA vaccines for HIV and whether or not they are reliable. And then we do all the writing and then we get them to delete, delete the, the key performance indicators. Then they start to build that together and put all the transition phrases together. What am I saying? In other words, what I'm saying is that um, one of the best ways to teach writing is to write with them, is to write with them. Uh, and, and, and literally I type, you type, because as you type and they see on the screen, they are typing, but, they, but you remind them that they're typing actively. They're paying attention to how you write, what you write. You need to make mistakes. Show them you making mistakes as you write. You're going back to revising. You know, you're going back, oh, I didn't like the way I write this, rewrite again. Then they start to see all of the intricate processes that happen and that writing is not a linear process, but a, a, a feedback loop where we always go back, revise. This word is not appropriate. Oh, I repeated this twice, change. I need a transition sentence, you know? 
uh, I need a transition phrase or oh, punctuation. Let's think about that. So, so, um, so I, I think there is a lot to say about actually writing with them. You experience it with them as well. And then they go, wow, I, I've actually learned about this. But I want to share with you my secret. And this is, I always leave high school, whenever I do writing workshops with the science students, I will share with you my secret, okay? My secret, which I share with all of my students, which I encourage you also to share with your students. Let me share this with you before I say goodbye. Um, so oftentimes I'm asked, what is the secret to writing well? So what is the secret to writing well? And I will tell every student this, read, okay? The more you read, the better you write. This is going back to basics. I think you will agree with me that our students today don't read enough. And even if they do read, they're reading rubbish. So um, one of the best things to do is read. That's always the um, uh, 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 advice, top tip that I give students in the same way that I always tell them, you know, if you want to become a better presenter, if you want to become a better communicator, you want to speak better, well, listen more. I am only a good presenter because I am also a good listener. I like to listen and I'm paying attention to the way things are said, the rhetorics that are using, the nonverbal cues. These are all important. Nobody becomes a good writer overnight. Um, you need to read a lot, yeah? So um, I hope that um, every one of you have found something useful from the last four days. Um, I will miss all of you momentarily, but I hope to see everyone again um, in, in, in some shape and form. Uh, I think now is a good opportunity to close today's session. I have yet another workshop that I need to deliver now. Um, I really, really want to thank once again, all of you for your effort, your time, your commitment. Um, you know, I have so much empathy and so much respect for teachers. So I'm not a teacher myself because I work at a university, but so much respect for what you do. Um, uh, and, 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 and a group of, of people that I, I am certainly happy to, to be a part of. Um, thank you very much again. Um, Ravi, I, I hand the time back over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. G. It was a fantastic uh, summation today. And I'm sure, I mean, there are a lot of people putting uh, uh, this on chat that they will, they're going to miss you. So I think, I mean, this is for the first time I'm uh, looking at, I mean, a lot of educators writing, I'll miss you, Dr. G. I'll miss, so I'm, I mean, uh, overwhelmed with the kind of response that we have got here. And I'm pretty sure that we are going to uh, initiate uh, a lot of other conversations with the uh, Queensland State, with other universities there to uh, bring more uh, amazing people like you and uh, get them to interact with the Indian educators. I mean, uh, this first cohort, I mean, with request from Queensland was a little small, but uh, please do not underestimate the power of Indian educators. I can get you at least, uh, you know, 100,000 educators to attend the next masterclass there. Yeah? So I think the pilot was uh, pretty successful, Dr. G. And I think, I mean, you have a great fan following in India, I mean, from uh, all of these lovely educators here. And uh, Anaga, uh, a dear friend now, is also sharing the links of uh, uh, various Facebook pages and other Twitter pages. I mean, if you want to know more about uh, University of Queensland and a lot of other master classes, see, this was a collaboration between school news. But uh, since University of Queensland is a world top 50 university, they do a lot of collaborations, uh, just uh, like I mean, they're doing with News 18 this afternoon at 2 o'clock. They're having this uh, amazing panel there. So on CNN, BBC and all, I mean, uh, these are big people like, you know, so you need to follow them on social media and uh, look at, I mean, other uh, uh, masterclasses or any talks or any provocations, I mean, that other faculties are also giving. Uh, at the same time, if you want to know more about other masterclasses, I mean, that we do with collaboration uh, with such universities, uh, you can actually uh, follow our Telegram channel. Uh, my colleague, Vinay, will just post uh, the Telegram channel and the closed Facebook group for only educators. So the link is right there. You can thank us later. Just copy the link, paste it somewhere, and then you can come back and I'll give you another two minutes to thank Dr. G. Anaga, you would want to add something to this? Just wanted to thank you for all of your support, Ravi, and your very, very kind words. 
um, and of course, Dr. Jean, Ramya, and Vinay, and Shruti, and everyone that's made this possible. I've had a wonderful time, and I know everyone else has. Reading the comments is so overwhelming. Um, it fills our hearts, so that's good, and we're looking forward to you know delivering more of these events. To you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, also, uh, a very important person who was behind the scenes is Sagar Bahadur. Uh, I think, I mean, uh, a big, big thanks to Sagar here because he was the one who suggested when we were doing this kind of a collaboration, when UQ and we spoke and we said, I mean, we are going to train the teachers here because this is about time when they're all, uh, you know, in, uh, in confined in their homes. I think it was Sagar who said that, Ravi, I will bet all my uh, money on Dr. G. And I think, I mean, uh, I, I would like to thank him as well. Thank you, Ramya. Thank you, uh, Gitesh. Thank you, Shruti. Thank you, Anaga. Thank you, Dr. G. And thank you to all you lovely educators who joined uh, uh, this masterclass. And I so look forward to seeing you all on the, the other side. Black coffee on you. I'll not pay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. I've just posted the links once again in case it get, got lost. <laughs> but uh, have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. I'll just keep this meeting live for another couple of minutes so educators can copy uh, the links, the Telegram and the Facebook group and the links that Anaga shared. And I'll just mute and go off from the video.